All right. So we have been talking about the concept of Trinity. And it looks as though God is contradicting himself when he says that he is one. But at the same time, he describes himself in different scriptures as three persons. But in reality, when we say that God is one in three persons, it's not really a contradiction. Why? Because we are saying that when we look at the Trinity in one way, he is God in one. But when we look at the Trinity in a different way, he is three. We are not saying that he is one and he is three in the same way. He is one when we look at him in one way. He is three when we look at him in a different way. In no way are we saying that he is one and he is three in the same way. That would be a contradiction and we are not actually uh, making that contradiction. So what is this one way and a different way of looking at the Trinity? God in his being, in his substance, in the essence of who he is, he is one single divine being. That is who he is in his substance, in his essence. He is divine. Let me use an extremely poor, bad example. Okay, so please do not um, read too much into the example, but it's just to try and explain. I spent the entire night racking my brains on how to get this subject across to people. So please be a little patient with me. Let's say I give you a cup with some brown paste in it. And then I ask you and I say, what substance is this? Now, what's the essence of this paste? So what would you do? You would dip your finger into the brown paste. You would lick it and you say, ah, I know this substance. This is chocolate, is what you would say. So the, the basic essence of that thing, that paste, it's chocolate. That's basically what it's made up of. It, it is in, in, its, in, its, in its substance, in its being, in its essence, it is chocolate. So in, in that sense, what is God made up of? of? He's divine. He's, he's made up of divinity. So in his being, in his essence, in his substance, he's divine. But in another way, when you're thinking about his personhood, he's three. So in his substance, he is one divine being. But in his personhood, he is three persons. Um, that is one way of trying to explain it. Norman Geisler, a very reputed theologian, this is basically how he put it. He said, essence is what you are, you know, the substance that is you. And that is divine. God, what he is, the substance of what he is, he is divine. But person is who you are. He is three persons. Um, so if that makes sense to you, uh, excellent. Okay, so essence is what God is. Person is who he is. He is three persons. But what is he? He is divine. He is one divine being. Um, so, you know, in 1 John 4, 12, it says, no one has ever seen God. So no one has actually physically seen uh, God in his entirety. Yes, people have had visions and people have seen Jesus seated on the throne. But then God being a spirit being, uh, you know, in his triune nature, no one has actually seen him in his entirety. So um, if we could see him with our physical eyes, if we could see him, we would see him, we would see that he is one God. There would be no doubt about that. If we could see him physically, we would see him as one God. But we would also recognize the fact that this one God is three persons. So for us to be able to understand a concept like that, we would need an entirely different kind of a mind, an upgraded higher level of thinking to be able to do that. But that is basically the fact. 
if we could see him we would recognize that he is one single divine being but in our superior understanding if such a thing exists we would be able to recognize that oh he's three persons okay so they both exist together in um, uh, in in balance i mean um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a united concept that he is one and he is also uh, three now we have to understand that this three persons are three distinct persons um because there are some wrong doctrines going around and one of the wrong doctrines is that um this was actually one of the uh, one of the ancient uh, wrong teachings which was there in uh, you know in the early church times they started this idea that when god was creating the universe he chose to assume the form of the father and then uh, later when he wanted to send the the son to the earth he chose to come down to this to this earth as the as jesus uh, christ and then now today he is you know, working in the church in the form of the holy spirit so basically the wrong teaching which they were you know um spreading is that he is basically one god and depending on circumstances he assumes one form or the other form but no he is not just three forms of the same god we are most definitely not saying that um he uh, so we don't look at him and say okay uh, he one form of god is father one form of god is so we're not talking about forms he only has one form one substance he is one divine being but he is in three persons very sorry about that but that's the limit of my english can't go beyond that um so um one thing that people say is you know uh, those who want to criticize they say oh so if jesus is god when he came down to the earth and he would pray to god he was basically praying to himself is what they would say but uh, when we look at the scriptures um we see that each person of the trinity has a very distinct awareness that they are one separate person there's no confusion in the mind of god about whether he is father or whether he is son he is aware that there are three persons involved um again to use a rather silly example let's think of anuj and tanuj who we shall say are identical twins okay so um now you know you walk up to anuj and you say to the kid um hey are you not tanuj the child will laugh at you and he'll say no i am anuj he is tanuj this child has a clear awareness and consciousness of himself as a distinct person when he's talking about himself he refers to himself as i i am anuj he is aware that tanuj is not him he uh, he is aware of the fact that tanuj is a separate person so he points at tanuj and he says tanuj that is tanuj so he in the same way when you come to the trinity there's no confusion in the trinity you see in john 1141 where this is uh, this on the occasion when uh, jesus is about to you know raise lazarus from the dead uh, and jesus says you know then jesus looked up and said father i thank you that you have heard me there's no confusion in the mind of the godhead about uh, you know there's no it's not like that split personality problem which people some people have in you know, a medical issue no god is very clear that he is one in his substance and he is three in persons okay and we need to accept that um so when jesus was praying on the earth he was most definitely not praying to himself people who say that are saying it because they are not they are ignorant of the truth that the one god has three persons they are unaware of that so that's the reason that's the reason why they make this mistake so uh, it's a lot of us find it very easy to think of god the father as a person 
uh, we also find it easy to understand Jesus as a person because he literally came down to the earth and moved with people, lived with people. But uh, some believers tend to be a little vague when it comes to the Holy Spirit. I remember one church that I used to attend in my early days. And there was this one person, really lovely person. I mean, she was very God-fearing, very committed. But whenever she would talk about the Holy Spirit, she would say it. You know, I mean, it's just her thinking. I mean, uh, she was from another faith. So maybe, I mean, she maybe she still had did not have a strong grasp of her doctrines. So she would always refer to the Holy Spirit as it. But the Holy Spirit is not an it for the simple reason in, um, you know, in John chapter 16, verse 7, when Jesus is talking about, you know, how uh, the Father will send another helper. Uh, this is what Jesus says. Uh, so if someone could read out for us, John chapter 16, verse 7. John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that uh, I go away. For if I do not uh, go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. It, Jesus doesn't say, I will send it to you. He very clearly says, I will send him to you. It's a person that he is sending, the third person of the Godhead. That is whom he is sending. So we should not think of the Holy Spirit as a, as an it. He is as much as as much a person as the Father and the Son. Okay, he's very much a person, and he has all the uh, qualities of a person. A person speaks, and in Hebrews three seven, you have the Holy Spirit speaking. He says, "Today, if you hear His voice." Okay, so it says, so as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, and then it goes on and on. Uh, so the, he, he speaks, that's the way persons speak. He reasons, he thinks and he reasons the way persons think and reason. Because it says in Acts 15, 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, a person, thought about it and it seemed good to him. Um not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. Okay, so that's basically Acts 15, 28. He has a will of his own. The way persons, you know, have a will. They can decide what they want, what they don't want. The Holy Spirit has a will. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, where it says, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit. You know, it's talking about the spiritual gifts over here. And he, that is the Holy Spirit, distributes these gifts to each one just as he determines. So the Holy Spirit has a will. He decides, okay, I'm going to give this person this gifting and I'm going to give this other person this other ministry gifting. Um, so um, he also has feelings, Ephesians 4.30. Because it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So he has feelings, just the way persons have feelings. He also has fellowship. He relates with people. He interacts with people the way persons interact uh, with one another. Second Corinthians 13, 14, where it says, you know, that's, the, that's the thing, the, the benediction which we read out a little earlier, where it says that we are meant to enjoy the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God and also the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so uh, he is able to fellowship with us. He is able to relate with us. So after having seen all these qualities of the Holy Spirit, we cannot call him an it. That would be a big mistake. He is a person. Okay, So that's basically how we should see him as a person. Um, so... Um, we looked at one of the old, um, you know, wrong teachings which was prevailing at the time of the early church, um, where they believed that one God appeared in three different forms at three different points of time. Um, the problem with that wrong teaching is that they are assuming that the Father can be um, that God can be father and when he's showing himself in the form of father, he's unable to show himself in the other two 
uh, ways as the other two persons. Okay, that's the wrong uh, doctrine which they are conveying because they are saying he takes three different forms. One God takes three different forms. If they say that, they are saying that when as long as he's in the in the form of Son, he cannot reveal himself in the form of Holy Spirit. But that is not what the Bible says about the living God. At this very moment, even as I am talking over here, God is Father. But simultaneously, He is also Son right now in this very moment. And in this very moment, He is also the Holy Spirit. So it's not like three separate forms at three different points of time. Not at all. So um, the term that is used for that wrong teaching which they have about God, one God having three forms, uh, that would be modalism. Uh, but why do we even need to know about this modalism? That's because today we have someone called, uh, we have this group of people called the Oneness Pentecostals. And the Oneness Pentecostals, they hold on to this idea that at one point of time, God can only be in one form. That is the wrong idea which they have. Um, but uh, when we look at Matthew 3, 16 to 17, uh, the verse where, uh, you know, the portion where Jesus gets baptized. We don't see God being in only one form at one point of time. In that one point of time when that baptism of Jesus is happening, we see him presenting himself in all three forms simultaneously. Uh, so if we could, we could actually read out that. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the Spirit of God descending like a dove and a, a, a light upon him. Verse 17. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Here we see God presenting himself in one single moment in all the three forms. It's not like as if, you know, he takes on one form at one point of time and then in the next point of time, he turns himself into the other form. No, we see all the three forms, all the three, to, to be more precise in the way we are using this term, the all three persons, not forms, all three persons we see of the Godhead being present over here. Jesus is coming out of the water. The Holy Spirit is coming down upon him. And the voice of God the Father is saying, this is my son. So we see all the three persons presenting themselves simultaneously in one single moment. All right. So um, now there's this other idea, a wrong idea, which was prevailing back then in those days, another wrong teaching, which of course was basically that uh, God is three separate gods. Uh, so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct separate gods who are sharing one same substance. Uh, this would be called tritheism. And the Mormons of today, in fact, uh, hold on to this teaching. They believe that there are three gods, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and all of them share this divinity between them. But saying that the three persons are sharing the divinity leads to a lot of wrong teaching. So again, let's use one of our silly examples to try and understand this. The danger of saying that you know, the three persons are sharing the divinity creates a lot of doctrinal um, wrong teachings. Um, so let's take the example of a cake. And let us say that when the bakery sends you the cake, they have already cut it into three portions. So when the cake arrives at your doorstep, uh, and you open the cake box, there are three portions. The cake is sitting over there in three separate portions. And they're all sharing one substance, chocolate. Okay, so they are uh, sharing the substance of chocolate. Now what happens? You pick up one of the portions, you pick it out of the box, you place it on a plate separately. So now that 
that piece, that portion which is sitting over there separately, it is having only one third of the chocolate. So in fact, if you were you know, using the parallel to talk about the divine Godhead, you would basically be saying, oh, God the Father is only one third God. And Jesus is only one third, um, uh, you know, God. And that is a very risky thing to say, because uh, that is not the God that we see mentioned and described in the Bible. Um, because let's look at one, uh, one, one scripture portion. Yeah, you know, Colossians 2, 9, which we read earlier, where it says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So Jesus Christ, when he was in bodily form on the earth, all of the divinity was in him. 100% of the divinity was in him. So if the three persons are sharing the divinity, what happens? The entire divinity is there residing in Jesus in his bodily form. So what about the Godhead who is supposed to be sitting on the throne in heaven? He would basically have 0% of the, of the divinity because Jesus has taken all of it. Do you see how dangerous that doctrine is? How foolish the doctrine could be? So they're not sharing the divinity. If you're going to use the example of a cake, this is basically how you would have to understand the Trinity. You would not say that Jesus is one third cake. Jesus is complete cake. But God the Father is also complete cake. He's not one third cake, he's complete cake. And the Holy Spirit is not one third of the cake, he's complete cake. So even if you just take, you know, Jesus and place him over there, he's fully divine, not one third divine, he's fully divine. So when Jesus was on the earth, 100% divine, God the Father was seated on the throne, 100% divine. He did not lose out on his divinity in any way because he independently is fully divine. Jesus independently is fully divine. But these three persons are one. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, the, you should look at the expressions on the students here in this room. Um, so, okay. Another uh, wrong teaching which was there, which created a lot of problems back then in the early church. Arianism. You might have heard of it, you know. Arianism. This was the teaching that Christ was a created being. God the Father created Christ. And we already, in fact, dealt with this. Uh, but this is what the Jehovah Witnesses believe in today. You know, it's the modern form of Arianism, uh, where they believe that God the Father is divine, but Jesus Christ is a created being, is what they say. And of course, you know, they take that scripture which we talked about when we were talking about the nature of God, Colossians 1, 15 to 17, where it talks about Jesus as the firstborn over all creation. We already talked about it. That word firstborn, which is being used over there, it's not talking about biological birth. It is talking, it's a legal term being used in a legal way, talking about who has the inheritance rights. So the person who has the inheritance rights, he is called firstborn. That is his legal status. That is his legal position. Um, and uh, so if you were to look at Colossians 1, 15 to 17, it talks about how all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, through him, through Jesus, for Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So that's basically what Colossians 1, 15 to 17 says. So it's talking about how all of creation is his inheritance. In that sense, in that legal sense, he is the firstborn. Because this was something that they were familiar with in those days. You know, if a man had two sons, his firstborn, the one who has been biologically born to him first, would generally be the firstborn also in the legal sense. You know, he would give all his inheritance to that firstborn. Um, so, uh, but... What if that you know man dies, that first son dies? Then the second son would be called firstborn, not because he's been born uh, first biologically, 
but because that's the legal status which has now been given to him all the inheritance is going to go to the second guy because the first man died uh, so it's it's a legal term that is being used over there so if any jehovah witness person comes to you and says that the bible says that jesus was created you can show them how much you know about the jewish culture and then they can go check it up i mean they don't have to take you at your word they can actually go and look at the scholarly books which are written or oh, the blogs on internet will say just about anything you don't really need to trust the blogs but if you're really interested in knowing the truth you can go to the you know, the books which have the, which the original scholars have written about you know they've done detailed study regarding these things and they have written detailed books and journal articles about these things so the person can actually go and refer to those you know so um so um when it says first born over all creation it's talking about the legal status of jesus it's not saying that jesus was ever uh, created so this was a very serious issue back then in the time of the early church uh, so um in in 325 ad the christian leaders they came together in a council the council of nicaea and there in that council they had discussions and they decided that they, they, they're going to come up with the nicene creed it's basically a list of beliefs it basically says you know um i believe that you know um uh, god is in three persons and it goes on to give a list of beliefs so they 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 actually drew up this document which will state the true scriptural scripture based beliefs so that came to be known as the nicene creed and i remember um i think it was in my college days when we used to attend the methodist church so in the service we all would get up and we would all hold our hymn books in which the nicene creed is there and we would read it aloud and we would say i believe in god the father i believe in god the son it's a very nice thing to do uh, because you know that nicene creed was very prayerfully put together by the leaders of that time so that nobody in the later generations will have doubts about these very very important things uh, so um, that's basically the nicene creed which was drawn up in 325 ad so in that nicene creed it basically says that god is one being of one substance with three distinct persons the father the son and the holy spirit and that they are all three eternal and uncreated okay that's basically uh, what it says in that uh, nicene creed so now coming to some of the analogies some of the comparisons that people use to try and explain the idea of trinity now these are comparisons they are saying that the trinity is like this the trinity is like that object so they're trying to draw a comparison between the object and the idea of trinity but because they are trying to make a comparison with human objects they all these analogies fall short none of them can really explain the trinity the way it actually is so these analogies are all limited they're all defective so let's look at some of the more common you know um, comparisons that we are familiar with uh, the most familiar one is of the egg so they say uh, they say that the trinity is like an egg so you have the shell and then you have the you know the transparent white uh, liquid over there in uh, and then in the middle you have the yellow yolk but the problem with this analogy is that there are three different substances but god is one substance is divine so um, obviously this is not at all a good uh, you know comparison and then you have the comparison made with water so you have uh, water in solid state as an ice cube you know you start heating up the ice cube it turns it melts and turns into liquid into water and then it starts evaporating even as the heat increases it starts evaporating so they say the oh, the trinity is like that but the problem with this example is that when the ice cube is an ice cube it's not vapor and water it's only ice cube it's it's taking up one form at one point of time and the same point of time it cannot be cube and liquid and vapor it's it doesn't have the ability to do that 
So this uh, example of water also falls short. It doesn't quite explain the Trinity. And then uh, the example is used of the roles which a person can you know, play in his life. A man can be a father. You know, he can be a father uh, playing uh, football with his son, you know, in the backyard. So he's assuming the role of a father. But he can also be a son. You know, he's a father, but at the same time, he's also a son. Because you see, he can go to his dad's house and help his dad in fixing the, a, new light, a new tube light or something. So he can... So he is a father and at the same time, he's also a son. And he can also be a friend. You know, he can go to his friend's place. He can sit with his uh, friend and help him with his taxes. Uh, so, but the problem with this example is that he can only fulfill one of those roles at one time. At the same moment of time, he can't be playing football with his kid and fixing the tube light at his dad's place and helping his uh, friend with his taxes. But when we look at the triune God, that's basically what he does every single moment. You know, he is God the Father. At the same time, he is the Holy Spirit who is convicting us and prompting us in our hearts. And at the same time, we have Jesus interceding. So um, that uh, this, this human example of a man having three roles, uh, it cannot really um, you know, uh, be considered uh, valid because this human can only perform one role at one point of time. Uh, so people who are physicists, Christian physicists who know physics, came up with another um, comparison. Now, my physics scores were not to be discussed. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I do not know much about physics, but this is basically what they say about the nature of light. So this is an example which they use. So they say that one single photon of light, if you were to examine it in one way, you would see that it is waves. But, on the, in, uh, but if you examine that same single photon of light in another way, you would see that it is a quanta particle. It's little bundles of energy. So that single photon of light, in the same moment, it's functioning as a wave and also functioning as a particle. So they say this is one way of trying to explain the um, trinity. Sounds good, but then I do not know much about physics, so I would not be able to say uh, anything uh, much which would be useful. So having looked at these examples, um, Let's look at one, um, one saying, one quotation which someone has said. I liked it. It was, it was nice. This is what the, the quotation says about the doctrine of Trinity. It says, try to explain it and you'll lose your mind, but try to deny it and you will lose your soul. I thought that was like very, very relevant. But trying to explain it is like really difficult. Uh, it's difficult to wrap a human mind around something that is divine. You know, so yes, try to explain it and you'll lose your mind. But try to deny it and you will lose your soul. Because what does John 3.16 say? It says, God so, God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. If a person is not able to even believe in the divinity of Jesus then what hope does he have for eternity? So if you compromise on this concept of Trinity, uh, it can actually affect your you know, future destiny in eternity. So it is something that we have to accept by faith. It's true that we don't really understand how Trinity functions, but by faith, we choose to accept that God, Yahweh, is one. And this one Yahweh, is three persons. It's something that we just accept by faith. Now, um, this Nicene Creed, which we just talked about, uh, it this is what it says. It says that, you know, um, all the three persons of the Godhead are equal, even though functionally, for the purpose of our redemption, the Son and the Holy Spirit are submissive to the Father. 
you know how how do the three persons of the of the trinity relate to one another they are all equal that much is clearly established but when it comes to the functionality of the redemption plan the son and the holy spirit chose to submit to the father and place themselves under the father only for the purposes of the redemption plan but in their being in their substance obviously they are uh, equal so um what do we see how do we how do we see the trinity you know uh, functioning in the redemption plan of human kind god the father he designed he created this entire idea because it says in galatians 4 4 to 5 but when the set time had fully come god sent his son so god was orchestrating events actions prophecies he brought them all together in a particular way so that it will all lead up to the set timing when the son can be sent so he designed and he orchestrated all of these events he started off in the beginning by choosing one man abraham he decided this is the man through whom i'm going to create descendants uh, from which lineage the messiah is going to come and then he had to protect these descendants so when there was this great famine god saw to it that even long before the famine came god arranged that this boy joseph should not be murdered his life should be saved because through this boy god is going to save the descendants of abraham and not allow them to be finished off and then later when herod was trying to um, you know uh, attack the baby jesus again god arranged for an angel to come and speak to joseph and give him a warning so that you know they can leave from there so god arranged events so that at the set time the son can come and fulfill his purpose so you could say that god the father is the designer the organizer of this entire redemption plan but who's the one who implemented it who's the one who fulfilled this plan that obviously would be jesus christ the son so um in john 6 37 to 38 this is what jesus says he says i have come down from heaven not to do my will but to do the will of him who sent me so he came in submission to the father to implement to fulfill this redemption plan uh, so as far as the redemption plan is concerned he has chosen to place himself under the authority of the father and he says whatever the father asks me to do i'll do only that but when you look at him in his substance is equal with the father in the same way the holy spirit what is his role he is the one who is now running the redemption plan on a daily basis he is the one who goes to people and he convicts them of sin and righteousness and judgment he is the one who brings conviction into people's hearts so that they will be brought into this redemption plan so that they will be saved and not only uh, unbelievers he also works in believers you know he transforms them um Ezekiel 36:27 if someone could read out Ezekiel 36:27 Ezekiel 36 was 27 I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgment and do them so the role of the holy spirit in the redemption plan of god very very essential throughout the entire old testament you had the people struggling to keep the word to the to keep the law of god they failed they failed miserably but this is the promise which god makes in the old testament he says one day you know i will put my spirit in all of you and when i put my spirit in all of you he will move you to follow my decrees so then you will be able to actually keep my law you will be able to keep my commandments so the role that which the holy spirit plays is very very important uh, you know in the redemption plan which we all are uh, part of today so uh, when it comes to the 
persons of the trinity relating to one another or to one another um, the son and the holy spirit choose to submit to the father and place themselves under the father but when it comes to them in their substance they are uh, equal so this is all i have to say regarding the trinity if anyone has any questions not yeah. exactly like a question but just something like a small observation uh, sometimes we try to understand uh, too much of it and uh, we are not getting the entire concept of Trinity. Uh, it's better that we just uh, understand what we can understand and it is, uh, we leave it to the spirit to, you know, lead us and guide us to, you know, go on with it. And uh, yes. also what I've uh, observed is that, you know, most churches uh, in, uh, you know, the sermons and whatever series that we follow, uh, we uh, somewhere we uh, emphasize too much on God the Father and uh, Jesus and His ministry and thing, but somewhere we undermine, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So, yeah. So, like he's saying, um, God has given us enough information to at least understand partially the outline, the Trinity. So let's be content with that. Let's be satisfied with that. He always reveals enough for us to be able to believe in him and trust him. But he doesn't uh, tell us everything. But he gives us at least a little bit so that we can, you know, knowledgeably follow him, honor him. So that he has given us. He has given us enough detail to at least partially understand what he is saying. And so based on that, again, like you said, we should start regarding the Holy Spirit and the role which he plays as being equally important to the role of the Father and the role of the Son. Because these are three persons of the Godhead who have together participated in the redemption plan so that we can enjoy the life that we are having now and we have a great promise to look forward to when we will uh, see uh, Christ and be like him and we will have resurrected bodies. So. Uh, yeah, so we need to value all the three persons of the Godhead. Any other thoughts, observations? Not a question in, in mm. line with Trinity, but in uh, the book of Jude, uh, chapter 1, uh, 20, it says, second part, mm. praying in the Holy Spirit. So what is that? If you can just throw some light on it. <laughs> praying in the Holy Spirit. So, to... To answer the question in a very neutral manner, if you were to ask that question uh, to somebody from a non-charismatic church, they would just simply say, praying in the Spirit means the Spirit will enable you, help you to pray in the right way. He'll bring the right thoughts and ideas into your mind and then um, uh, you will be able to pray regarding that very difficult situation in the correct way because you're praying in the Spirit. Because we have this other scripture where it says that, you know, he groans with groans which cannot be uttered so we are unable to express what's in our heart because the situation that we are facing is so difficult and so tough and so we we uh, ask the holy spirit to help us uh, pray and so then uh, he prays on our behalf now that is what the non charismatic people would say charismatics on the other hand would say no it's definitely referring to the to the tongues because the holy spirit uses the instrument of tongues to be able to uh, you know pray through us so he groans through uh, through our tongue through our mouth so what's coming out from our mouth may not be intelligible to us but he's using employing our tongue to groan on our behalf and present the situation uh, so that is just to present both sides of it uh, so yes that tension will always be there between the charismatic uh, uh, churches and the non-charismatic churches regarding these things but it's good not to get too um, um, stressed out and too uh, controversial regarding this you know i mean as in you know uh, picking arguments and all of that those from non-charismatic churches who experience the holy spirit and experience the gift of tongues, suddenly start seeing the scriptures in a new light because it's something that they have experienced. It's actually happened to them. And so then it becomes easier for them to see these scriptures as referring to the to tongues. 
but those who have not yet had that experience of tongues they may feel that no this is a very logical way of looking at these verses it's just the holy spirit helping it's it's got nothing to do with tongues is what they would say so it's just perspectives and also partially to some extent based on their personal experiences um how much how many minutes do we have we have 5 minutes uh if you remember i spoke about my um college days when i was attending a methodist church and we would read out the nicene creed so our methodist church had a youth camp uh, for our youth at that time and uh, when we went to that youth camp when we knew almost nothing about the holy spirit but there in that camp there was a move of the holy spirit and we have all these methodists speaking in tongues i mean half the girls don't even know what's coming out of their mouths uh you know and they they open their mouths and it's all pouring out and they have no clue what they are doing but there's a mighty move of the holy spirit happening in that methodist camp and in fact now uh, you know i still have a uh, photograph of of all of us together in the camp on the last day almost every person in that photo is now involved very actively in ministry in one way or the other so that is something which god did in a methodist church uh so there are no limits to what god can do and uh, so sometimes based on our experiences we are we become more open and willing to see certain scriptures maybe in a different way you know than when the way we saw it earlier because after that camp i suddenly wanted to know more about this holy spirit so that completely changed the course of my life you know so um yeah so there are two interpretations to the jude uh, where 20 and 21 verses yeah anything at all that anyone else wants to say no all right then in that case we'll close with a word of prayer nothing has been posted here uh, but yeah let's close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much uh, that you choose to reveal yourself to us lord uh, it's true that in our finite mind we don't always understand um all about you because you are infinite you are holy you're set apart you're unique you're other so we cannot fully comprehend you but you have revealed enough of yourself in the scripture so that we can learn to trust you so that we can learn to honor you and lord we can build our lives and uh, found our lives on you as the foundation thank you o oh lord for giving us that much detail about yourself and we pray that with what we know about you we will value all the three persons of the godhead and we will recognize the work that you are doing in our lives on a daily basis um through the three persons of the godhead we thank you o oh lord for this in jesus name amen thank you